Good evening to those of us who are joining this event. We'll get started in just a moment or two here. Um, we're just giving everyone uh, some time to join the, um, the broadcast. So we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Kelly Bolter, the Adult Programming Coordinator at Milwaukee Public Library. Welcome to the U.S. and the Holocaust, Old Debates and New Approaches, a presentation in support of Americans in the Holocaust, a traveling exhibition for libraries, which is now on display at Milwaukee Central Library um, through January 5th, 2024. Milwaukee Public Library is one of 50 U.S. libraries selected to host Americans in the Holocaust, which is a traveling exhibition that examines the motives, pressures, and fears that shaped Americans' responses to Nazism, war, and genocide in Europe during the 1930s and 1940s. The exhibit is an educational initiative of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the American Library Association. The exhibit is supported by a robust calendar of events and programs that will help visitors read, learn, and connect. Following this webinar, we'll be sharing out a downloadable PDF book and resource list um, that will help you explore more about the topic in our library collections, plus a calendar of our upcoming programs. Tonight, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Barry Trachtenberg for this very special presentation. Dr. Trachtenberg is the Rubin Presidential Chair of Jewish History at Wake Forest University and serves on the Board of Scholars of Facing History and Ourselves, formerly a member of the Academic Council of the Holocaust Educational Foundation of Northwestern University, and is currently a member of the Academic Advisory Board of Jewish Voice for Peace. Dr. Treffenberg will share an insightful view into discourse around the compelling questions posed by this exhibit, uh, which are, what did Americans know about the Holocaust and what more could have been done? Um, we'll be sharing in the chat in just a moment, a link to um, Dr. Trachtenberg's book, The Holocaust and the Exile of Yiddish, um, which is available in Milwaukee Public Library's collection for checkout. Um, and he has other books as well. So um, if you enjoy this one, uh, please check out his other titles as well. Um, so just a couple housekeeping details. Um, you probably noticed your microphones are muted. Um, if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, you can feel free to drop those in the Q&A. You should see the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And feel free to chat amongst yourselves in the chat uh, box as well. There is a chat button on the bottom of your screen uh, right next to the Q&A button. Um, so we will have time um, at the end for uh, those uh, Q&A and questions uh, with Dr. Trachtenberg. So um, without further ado, um, I am very pleased to introduce Michael Morris, who is representing the Nathan and Esther Pell's Holocaust Education Resource Center. Um, and they are the library's exhibit programming partner for this exhibit run. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Morris, the Community Engagement Manager at the Nathan and Esther Peltz Holocaust Education Resource Center. We're also known as HERP, and we're a program of the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. And I'm just going to uh, share my screen uh, real quickly. Um, so first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight to hear uh, Dr. Barry Trachtenberg's lecture, The U.S. and the Holocaust, Old Debates and New Approaches. This is one in a series of programs that HERC and the Milwaukee Public Library are partnering on related to the visiting U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum exhibition, Americans in the Holocaust. Future programs include a young professional happy hour on November 29th and a screening of the 45 minute version of the PBS documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust on December 7th. This screening will include a virtual Q&A with co-director Sarah Botstein, Additionally, on December 10th, we have Stories of Survival and Hope, an afternoon with Holocaust survivor Ava Zaret. So we hope to see you there. 
Before we start, I'd like to briefly let you know about HERC and Holocaust education in Wisconsin. Something highly significant happened in Wisconsin in April 2021, when Governor Evers signed Wisconsin Act 30, mandating Holocaust and genocide education at the middle school and high school levels. And he's uh, holding hands with Ava Zarat, uh, who's a survivor in our community. At HERC, we work inside and outside of schools to provide learning experiences about the Holocaust and other genocides, including the Speakers Bureau, where Holocaust survivors, the children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors tell their stories of survival or their family's Holocaust history, workshops for educators so they have access to the best resources and learn the best methodology, school programs for middle school and high school students, and community programs and partner programs like this evening's program, when we bring academics, experts, authors, and others to our community so that we can learn more about the history of the Holocaust and other genocides. This slide shows HERC's impact. I'd like to draw your attention to the number 96,075. That's the number of students who were impacted by HERC in 2022. So why do we do this? Learning about the Holocaust and other genocides has a positive impact for our world. Uh, one way we see this is through the surveys completed by students after a learning experience with HERC. Overwhelmingly, students say that these educational experiences make them think about the way they treat others and encourage them to speak out when they see something wrong. The tool for educators uh, is HERC's, uh, the, the tool that we offer is HERC's Holocaust education map. This was made with teachers in mind, but it's free for everyone. It's a free resource to build reliable, respectful, and rigorous lessons on the Holocaust. The website to access it is teachholocaust.org. So thank you so much for listening, and I'm happy to now give the floor to Dr. Barry Trachtenberg. Welcome, Dr. Trachtenberg. Thank you so much, Michael. It's really my honor to be here this evening. I, I would like to thank the Milwaukee Public Library, uh, in particular, Kelly Bolter for arranging this talk, as well as Herc for uh, being a sponsor of it. I'd also like to show my appreciation to my uh, dear friend, uh, Dr. Joel Berkowitz, who is at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, the head of the Sam and Helen Stahl Center for Jewish Studies. Um, he and I go back 20 years um, when I was a, a brand new professor at my first job, and I'm really, really honored that you're here this evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm also going to start by sharing my screen um, for presentation here. Hopefully this will work. All right, so um, if that's not available, let me know. Um, and I wanna talk about, uh, as a way to start, talk about two um, cases um, that I've worked on um, in my own research. The first on the left, the story of Ella Kulka, was one that I first began working on as a very young graduate student 30 years ago. And the other is a project that I'm working on currently, the story of Kurt Baum, uh, the boy who's on the left in that second photo. So I'll just take a few minutes and kind of tell you a little bit about um, their histories here. So Ella Kalka was born on July 23rd, 1913 in Slovakia. As a teenager, she was taken into the care of two of her aunts, Rose and Juliet, and moved to the town of Brno in the Moravian portion of what was then Czechoslovakia as a teenager. She was trained as a dispensing chemist at Karlova University in Prague, earned her degree with honors, and by the age of 25, had learned English, French, German, Czech, Slovak, and Hungarian. With the Nazi occupation and annexation of the Czech portions of her country in 1939, Ella joined the ranks of tens of thousands of Jews who sought to make their way to the United States. Ella's aunt Juliet was a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and had ties to Ellen Starr Brinton, who was an officer of the will and the curator of the Jane Addams Peace Collection at Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Juliet hoped to utilize this prior contact by soliciting Brinton's help to secure safe passage and quick entry into the United States for her niece, Ella. In early 1939, Brinton enthusiastically responded that not only would she be willing to take up the case and begin gathering the appropriate papers, 
Well, she also offered to welcome Ella into her home and through the coming months or until she could find employment. In spite of having contacts in the United States and guaranteed employment, Ella soon learned that she would be placed on a waiting list for a visa that was over three years long. And the reason for this is that there was no legal mechanism for refugees to enter the United States under emergency circumstances. There was, however, as many of you know, if you've seen the exhibition, there was a quota system that was put in place. This quota system had been enacted in the 1920s by US Congress in order to limit the uh, immigration of what was determined to be racially undesirable peoples. And this meant much of Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, and then the global South was restricted in, in very significant ways from coming into the United States. And this quota system dis, uh, determined the, nation, the nationality of various immigrants. And so there were different numbers for people coming in from, from different countries. The quota at this point uh, was uh, that annually 2,874 people from Czechoslovakia were eligible to enter into the United States in any given year. Making matters more complicated was that there were additional regulations that were put in place during the Great Depression, most notably something called the LPC proviso, the likely to become a public charge proviso, which meant that all applicants had to demonstrate with significant documentation that they were not going to require government resources once they had arrived into the United States. So that meant they had to demonstrate they had assets of their own they're going to bring with them, which was really unlikely for, for most people fleeing uh, Nazi-controlled territory, as, as well as having uh, secure employment in the United States. So this was really quite a significant hurdle, which meant that for most of the 1930s, most of the time period during the, the Nazi crisis, only about 10% of that quota was filled in any given year. So to be eligible, what uh, Ella had to uh, acquire were affidavits from people within the United States who were willing to sponsor her application. By the, the end of that year, by the end of December 1939, several months into the German invasion of Poland, Brinton had finally secured two affidavits from prominent members of the Women's International League and even a letter of support from Senator Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr. With these important backers, it was reasonable to hope that Ella would gain entry sooner than what seemed to be the three years wait. Rosa wrote to say they were pleased that these, quote, supplementary papers will make it possible for to Ella for to accept your kind invitation much sooner than we had anticipated. Nevertheless, a month later, these hopes were dashed when the American Consul General wrote to say that no exception to the quota system would be granted and said, quote, your interest in the matter has been noted. And you may be assured that the case of Ms. Kalka will receive every consideration consistent with the law and regulations governing entry of aliens into the United States. In March of 1940, the application suffered a severe reversal when it was discovered that one of the affidavits in support of Ella had not been correctly filled out. This became a new source of worry. Um, and the, the confusion around the affidavits would continue um, until it came to the point where Ellen Starr Brinton decided that she would submit an, uh, an affidavit on, in support of Ella herself, which was a very risky endeavor given the limited salary she earned from the wealth and working at Swarthmore College. And this support ultimately was insufficient. In November 1940, a letter to Brinton arrived from the United States Consul General in Vienna expressing their, quote, regret to inform you that this consul general is unable to approve the documents. Your income and resources must be considered to be insufficient to warrant your undertaking to guarantee the support of this applicant to the United States. The will still held out hope for Ella as 1941 approached. It was now more than two years into the three-year wait, and because of past difficulties, her case was sent to the Refugee Committee of the American Friends Service Committee, the, the Quakers. Now, by the summer of 1941, Germany had conquered Europe and begun its massive assault on the Soviet Union. And of course, as we now know, the Holocaust against European Jewry was now fully underway. The situation had grown so desperate and Brinton then wrote to the Kalkas that she feared the recent international crisis would stop the flow of refugees altogether. 
But the United States was not yet in the war and there was still reason to hope. The will working with the AFSC promised they would keep working as hard as possible to secure Ella's rescue. Their letters to one another began to take on a more dismal tone as there was little progress to report and simple communication became important in and of itself. As Rosa Kalka wrote to Brinton in late June 1941, whether this letter can be posted and when and if it may reach you seems a matter of history. The closure of the American consulates in Germany in late July only lessened any hope that remained. By September, the letters from Rosa took on an urgent pleading tone. Quote, Ella is single. She has never been involved in any political activity. Her parents being dead, she has no place or abode on this side of the grave. That at least may be believed. Needless to say, we all appreciate everything that you have done and our other friends on your side of the ocean have done for us. We're very grateful and indeed very much averse to troubling you with our ever repeated queries. Brinton's reply was equally distressed. Your letter of September 13th fills me with deep concern. All travel has now ceased between this country and Central Europe. No visas are being issued in either direction. Thousands of persons are still coming from other parts of the world and these are being given every possible assistance. I hope that mail communications will continue regardless of what might come next. And as far as we, uh, or as far as we were able to determine, this last letter was never received by Rosa. At the end of the war, with the terrors of the Nazi machine being exposed to all, Ellen Starr Brinton began requesting information as to the fate of the Kolka family. On 11 June 1946, she received a letter from a contact that stated, only today am I in a position to answer your letter of February 19th, which contained both the inquiries about Rosa and Juliet Kolka. The results of my investigation were sad. Rosa Kolka died at the beginning of November 1942 in the concentration camp at Terezin. Julia Kolka and her niece Ella were moved from Terezin to Poland into the district of Lublin. And what that meant we now know only too well, they have not returned. It is all so dreadful. We've lost so many good friends. We miss them so very much. The second case that I'm currently working on with colleagues here at my university, I will um, just talk about uh, more, um, more succinctly that it has to do with this young man, Kurt Baum, who was born in 1920 in Bamberg, Germany, which is just north of Nuremberg in um, Germany's Bavaria region. He's the, he was the son of cattle dealers. His parents were uh, uh, cattle dealers in Bamberg. And he was sent to America in 1937 before the situation for European Jews would become catastrophic. Other members of his distant extended family had emigrated before him some generations early. And a family member in Cincinnati sponsored him and provided for his welfare. And what we have as the, the, the key source of, of evidence for the, the case of Kurt Bomber, a series of letters that were written to him by his family members in Europe, as well as some other letters about him that we have found. But we've actually not found hard, you know, anything at, at all really by him. The letters that we have range from 1937, when he was first uh, sent to the United States, to 1941, when um, his last parent um, was eventually murdered. The situation for Kurt, though, in coming to the United States was, was not an easy one. Um, he was very quickly, after arriving in Cincinnati, he was sent to the farm school, the National Farm School in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, which was an agricultural school that was set up sort of wayward Jewish youths um, to give them an agricultural education and, and get them out of urban environments. Not knowing much English, not really having any farm skills whatsoever, in spite of his parents being cattle dealers, they were, they were living within the city limits. He was very much alone and had a very, very difficult time at the farm school. In the course of the first year, he wasn't given very much in the way of any education. In, the, in March of 1938, his mother suddenly passed away uh, from an infection. And then at the same time, the whole school went on strike and there's an enormous disruption. They burned the dean in effigy um, until their, their, the students' demands were, were met. It was, it was a big scandal that made the New York Times. And all of this led to Kurt's sponsor, his uncle Milton, to threaten not only to pull him out of the farm school, to actually send him back to Germany. And the letters that we have uh, that are coming from first the mother and the father, and then later from the father, are 
just hostile letters sort of uh, browbeating him into behaving the right way. And by not the end of 1930, after Kristallnacht, the father himself is desperate to get out and hopes that this Uncle Milton will also rescue him. Uncle Milton, though, is very reluctant to do so on account of this, uh, Kurt's behavior and so does not want to sponsor the father. And so what we learn uh, in studying this history is ultimately the father is not successful in getting out. And in November 1941, he is deported to a sub camp of the Riga ghetto where he dies in um, early 1942 um, in that winter. So both of these stories, the one that I started at the very beginning of my graduate training and one that I'm working on now are, of course, just terribly tragic. One, in a sense, is more successful than the other. Kurt went on to have a full life in the United States, marrying and having two daughters, uh, had uh, several grandchildren, and was widely seen as a beloved figure. So although I've only given kind of small snippets of what are naturally much more involved histories, I'd like to pose some questions to sort of get this uh, discussion going in a way, to thinking like, what can these stories illuminate for us regarding the United States' response to the Holocaust? They could be viewed as a story of American indifference to the plight of European refugees. They could be viewed as a testament to the many Americans working both individually and in Jewish and non-Jewish organizations who advocated strenuously on behalf of endangered Jews. Certainly, they point to the, the, the mixed record of the American response to the refugee crisis. The stories, though, I think should also lead us to ask why is it that some Jews were provided sanctuary in America, and in fact, actually more than in any other Western allied nation, while so many others were denied? And above all, I think they tell us something about the necessity of considering the larger historical context when we talk about the complicated roles of the United States in the Holocaust. So, for example, Kurt Baum came to the United States in 1937 at a time when many Jews wanted to leave Germany, but not nearly in the same numbers who wanted to leave after 1938 and early 1939, when still before the war, Nazi violence against Jews became lethal. In 1937, Kurt was escaping oppression and segregation, whereas in 1939, Ella was fleeing for her life. So the question of the relationship of the United States and the Nazi Holocaust continues to be one that fascinates and compels debate in American society. Above all, it's a vexed question. Unlike European countries, the United States was neither a perpetrator of the Holocaust nor a victim of it. Instead, it held a range of other positions sort of in between those two poles. From the time of the rise of the, United, the, the Nazi, party, pa, Nazi party to power in January 1933 until the present day, the US has inhabited several roles that exist sort of separate from those two positions. Not only was the United States a bystander to the Holocaust, but it also acted as Germany's, Germany's adversary during the war. And its military efforts contributed to Nazism's persecution of its victims. US leaders decided not to amend laws that effectively prevented more refugees from finding sanctuary in the country. And they chose to maintain economic and diplomatic ties with Nazi Germany until almost the United States' entry into the war. Conversely, the United States was also a rescuer of imperiled Jews in its various attempts to find a solution to the refugee crisis before entering the war, through the work of the War Refugee Board during the war, and by its role in liberating concentration camps at the end of the war. Complicating this further is that in the post-war period, the United States became the inheritor of the legacy of the Holocaust, as it provided a home to many survivors, and is the site of numerous Holocaust memorials, monuments, and, and museums. At the same time, the United States was also a beneficiary of Nazi expertise, as many German scientists were provided sanctuary here in the United States in order to help fight the Cold War against the Soviet Union. So I think it's in part on account of the ambiguity of America's response to the Holocaust that it remains such a contested historical topic. The successful Americans in the Holocaust exhibition at the Holocaust Museum and Ken Burns's recent documentary, The U.S. and the Holocaust, have helped to give the subject, uh, to keep the subject very much in the public discussion, 
as have efforts by those who on several points in the political spectrum who would draw upon this history to influence America's current refugee policy. So in this talk, what I would like to do is to address the pendulum-like swings that have existed in popular and scholarly attitudes towards the United States. Um, so I'll, in doing so, I'll discuss wartime and immediate post-war attitudes. And then I'd like to talk about how this, the attitudes that existed during the war in terms of how the US responded to the catastrophe began to change in the 1960s. And then I'll talk about more recent approaches to the question and how maybe attitudes are starting to shift a little bit again. And then finally, I'll raise some questions that might point to possible research uh, moving forward. So the question of the US and the Holocaust, rightly or wrongly, often hinges on attitudes towards President Roosevelt and his administration. There are reasons for this, but as you will see, I, I think this is somewhat insufficient. Um, so during the, the war years, I'm gonna try to advance my slides here, there we go. During the war years, Roosevelt was widely loved by American Jews who saw him as a progressive force against a reluctant Congress and court. He was largely friendly to Jewish Americans, appointing Felix Frankfurter to the Supreme Court, Henry Morgenthau Jr. to the cabinet, and had many, many other trusted advisors. In each of his elections, um, polling indicates that 80% or more of American Jews voted for Roosevelt. On the refugee issue, which began at the same moment as FDR assumed his presidency, there were a range of political positions. And here I think it's worthwhile to remember that the, the terms in office for Roosevelt and Hitler are almost identical. They begin and end within just a few weeks of, of one another. So their administrations are really very much coterminous. Um, but what we see is that um, on the refugee issue, uh, most Jewish Americans supported him. Um, there was uh, a range of, of Jewish political positions on the issue, however, on the political left and right, uh, you know, the labor movement, and then also in particular revisionist Zionists were quite critical of the president's unwillingness to um, challenge Hitlerism more forcefully. Um, Yet there was hesitancy among many moderate or progressive Jews on pressuring Roosevelt too far, right? So you have groups like the American Jewish Congress, which are trying to take a, a sort of a, a tougher stance um, and push Roosevelt in the early 1930s to take a tougher stance against Hitlerism. But they're restrained in part because they're, they're concerned that Losing FDR, alienating him, means losing any toehold whatsoever into the political scene. And there was also concern that pushing too hard might injure Jews' tenuous status in the United States. Um, the position of Jews was not solidified yet um, in the country the way that it would be after the war. In addition to that, Jewish leaders also learned a harsh lesson in the immediate months after Hitler's rise to, uh, to power to assuming the chancellery. Um, for soon after he comes into office, Rabbi Stephen Weiss, leading the American Jewish Congress, called for a famous boycott of Nazi Germany, which became the pretense that the Nazis used for a boycott on uh, German Jews in April of that year. Nevertheless, the port for Roosevelt stayed strong during the war years, uh, once the U.S. enters in December 1941. The United States, of course, sent two million soldiers to Europe, you know, who had one goal, that of stopping Hitler. And American Jews signed up in enormous numbers. And for most American Jews at the time, this went a long way towards saving European Jews. Most Jews at the time accepted the basic logic that the best way to save the Jews was to defeat the Nazis. More than half a million Jews served in the armed forces during the war. One in nine American Jews serves. Roosevelt himself in, 19, in early 1944 forms an organization called the War Refugee Board, which extends assistance to estimated numbers, you know, are in the tens of thousands of Jews who are imperiled in Europe. Um, and he also allowed a small, you know, perhaps token number of refugees to, to find sanctuary in Fort Ontario in Oswego, New York, in the last months of the war. 
what this did, what this level of support did in many ways was to help solidify American Jewish backing for the Democratic Party, which lasted over the next several decades. Now, after the war, American Jews largely participated in the post-war prosperity that is uh, around the United States. Racially speaking, Jews began to be greater, uh, more, more, you know, uh, more accepted uh, into the category of white America. Uh, they're, they're allowed to move into formally uh, segregated spaces or spaces that were denied to them. Legislatively, this uh, admission into a white society was paved by the GI Bill and federal housing loans, which were made available to Jews as whites, but which were denied to other people for, for being black. And culturally, uh, by experience in World War II, both sympathy for Jews um, uh, began to grow in the United States. There was a, there was a, a time of, uh, if, you, if you look at popular magazines from the 1940s into the 1950s, there's this moment where Jews are sort of being reintroduced to American society. Um, and what this does in many ways is it leads Jews to maintain strong ties to the Democratic Party, <clears throat> which still exists in many ways um, to, to really to this day. This attitude towards FDR, towards um, the United States' response to the Holocaust, began to shift, however, starting in the, the mid-1960s as part of the intersection of several gener generational shifts that were underway at the time. In one place, there's a new willingness among American youth to begin criticizing the gains of, of World War II and the post-World War II seemingly conservative political order. In many ways, it's the 1960s reacting to the conservatism, of course, of the 1950s. In addition to this, there's a very strong level of Jewish participation in the civil rights movement to the point where the historian Edward Shapiro estimates that about half of the civil rights attorneys in the South in the 1960s were Jews and nearly two thirds of the white volunteers who went south to Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1964 were Jews. And so there's this new willingness among American Jewry to begin criticizing the United States, to begin looking at this legacy with a much more sort of critical air to it. And it's in this age of civil rights, of decolonization, of new politics of the, of the left, many young Jews begin to question really whether the United States is a force for good in the world. You know, something that their parents' generation held as really this, this absolute fact. At the same time, in the later 1960s, this questioning of sort of the, 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 the Jewish sort of fealty to the United States begins to combine with a new ethnic pride in American Jewry that accompanied a, a Jews' movement into the white middle class. In many ways, it's tied to American Jews pulling away from the civil rights movement in the later 1960s to focus on issues of particular concern to their community. Jews begin to vote Democrat, or I'm sorry, continue to vote Democratic, but their economic, racial, and social interests were increasingly aligning with the agendas, uh, the, the agenda of the party's more moderate wing. As African-American uh, activists faced the halting progress of the civil rights movement, some came to reject the integrationist approach that was typically favored by liberal Jews and to demand more radical approaches that tended to alienate their Jewish supporters. Further, as the historian Cheryl Lynn Ginsburg, uh, Greenberg has demonstrated in her book, Troubling the Waters, although Jews still express racism, less racism than other whites, they nonetheless engage in the same social segregation of blacks that white Christians had made tradition. So when civil rights activists began to advance affirmative action solutions to solve persisting racial uh, inequality questions, many Jews, including groups such as the Anti-Defamation League, opposed them believing that they were an attack on the colorblind society for which they had long fought, and that such policies promised Jews as a group no tangible benefits. At the same time, we also see a reclaiming of a hybrid Jewish-American identity. This occurs in part because of Israel's 1967 success, uh, uh, mil mil military success, which caused many young Jews to identify with the new state, 
And then, of course, later, the, the plight of Soviet Jews became a specifically Jewish cause around which many Jews took that same energy they had applied to civil rights, began applying it to this particular cause. And it begins to bring about a coalescing of American attitudes towards Israel, a process that had begun uh, back in the 1930s. So these larger societal shifts that are happening contribute to some historians beginning to re-examine the historical period and the relationship of the United States and the Holocaust and begin questioning many of the basic assumptions that American Jews had held about this era, including use of the bomb, the incarceration of people of Japanese ancestry during the war, the Cold War and the Red Scare, that was the outcome of World War II. But it also leads, of course, to new scholarship on the United States and the Holocaust. Um, and you can tell the tone by the, the titles of these works, right? So the, these works that began to appear in the late 1960s, such as Arthur Morse's While Six Million Died and Saul Friedman's No Haven for the Oppressed, Monty Noam Penkower's, Jews were expendable and others, and mo perhaps mo most uh, importantly, in some ways, influentially, David Wyman's first book, Paper Walls, and then later, The Abandonment of the Jews, began to bring about uh, a new questioning about whether the United States did all that it could. And it focuses in particular on the question of uh, refuge prior to the war, and then the question of interfering with the Holocaust and somehow disrupting the Holocaust while it was occurring. What these works, almost all of them uh, uh, conclude was that the United States did too little and was very often, you know, perhaps as anti-Semitic as the Nazis themselves. And it, that, uh, that sense that Roosevelt had been a hero to the Jews, these works sort of roundly conclude that um, that was misguided and that Roosevelt, driven by his own anti-Semitism, by the anti-Semitism that was rife through his administration, really did all they could to thwart any effort um, to save European Jews. And this idea begins to gain steam and it leads to a whole series of, of new literature that continues through the 1970s, the 80s and the 90s. So Deborah Lipstadt, her first book um, was called Beyond Belief on the, the role of the American press in the Holocaust. Laura Leff um, does uh, some uh, serious work about uh, att really attacking the New York Times for its seeming um, you know, ignoring of the Holocaust. And this questioning goes so far that some Jewish leaders begin questioning whether the Jewish leaders who preceded them did all that they could. And so there's this famous book by uh, Haskell Luxine, or We Are Brother Keeper, where we are brothers keepers, which concludes no, that unite that uh, American Jewry, you know, he argues, should have moved, tried to move heaven and earth, um, but they didn't, that they were sort of too comfortable in their homes. So what we see is that the pendulum, which had sort of been very much on, on one side in favor of, of Roosevelt, you know, by the, the 1970s, 1980s, has really kind of swung in the other direction. So that the consensus is that the United States really abandoned its commitment to, to, to Jews during the Holocaust. And a sign of the, the dominance of this narrative was that it forms the basis of the, what's uh, still the permanent exhibition of the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. So for those of you who have um, uh, toured this exhibition, which is now you know, more than um, 25 years old, I guess it's now 30 years old, um, at the outset, when, when, after you enter into the exhibition, after stepping off an elevator where you hear the voice of a, an American liberator, you walk in and you see this, this opening scene that, that's on the right, which is a picture of, um, of Eisenhower and other troops looking at a recently liberated camp. And the, so it begins with sort of the Americans' role as liberators, but then walks us through the whole history of the Holocaust and sort of special attention to the ways in which the United States did not fulfill its responsibility to help. And so what we have is sort of this, this uh, kind of interesting, uh, somewhat maybe problematic in a way, um, sort of understanding of the role of the United States was that of having finally 
you know, after abandoning its responsibility, comes out at the end as sort of liberators and heroes. And I should say the, the museum is, is re, sort of updating this exhibition, so it'll be interesting to see what they, they come up with. And so this attitude of, of the United States of having really abandoned American Jewry becomes the new consensus um, for, you know, in, into the 1990s. But I'll say that in spite of this consensus, the truth is that neither the original sin of indifference nor the redemption of liberation was as profound as many observers have insisted upon. And this begins to be demonstrated by yet another wave of attitudes towards these persistent questions. And the pushback to this consensus began more than 20 years ago first with a book by Peter Novick called The Holocaust in American Life. Um, so let's get to my next slide. Which challenged many of the broadly accepted assumptions about American acquiescence in the Holocaust and criticized what he saw was an over-fascination or identification with the Holocaust in the United States. And although this book is very often grouped together with Norman Finkelstein's Holocaust Industry, Finkelstein's book, which was actually written as an attack on, on, on Novik's. And what Finkelstein argues was that um, in spite of uh, Novik's argument that the Holocaust really fills this gap in American Jewish memory, um, well, he says it's not about memory, it's about power and it's about profit. And he really, he really goes against, uh, he really sort of takes on fully American Jewish institutions and their supporters who he charges with sort of instrumentalizing the issue of the Holocaust, linking it to pro-Israel politics, linking it to profiteering and so on. And these two works are often spoken of together because they're both strongly polemical in scope and targeted what were by then the new orthodoxies. They were important in a way for their critiques and for their contribution to political discussions but it's not clear they've had lasting influence among many historians on account of the overly, overtly, sorry, ideological agendas. And to, to be truthful, the writing style that often led them to be characterized as cranks. Perhaps the greatest contribution of, of these works was first to identify this new orthodoxy and begin knocking down some of its foundations. Now, in more recent years, the pendulum that sort of swung between these two positions has come to sort of rest for the moment, at least, kind of in the middle in some ways. What we see now is a new movement towards contextualization, uh, looking for a more balanced view and not trying to cast the, the, the Roosevelt administration and the FDR as either pure heroes to the Jewish people or pure villains kind of working against them, but instead looking at what were the political and structural obstacles that were in place that blocked any uh, greater efforts at refugee assistance. The historian Richard Brightman, working with his co-author um, Alan Kraut, attempted this in a sort of reassessment in a book from 1987 called American Refugee Policy in European Jewry. But that book was sort of really overshadowed by other events. So it wasn't until 2013 that Richard Brightman, this time working with Alan Lichtman, put forward the first sort of sustained challenge to this new orthodoxy that the U.S. had abandoned European Jews to its fate. With their book, FDR and the Jews, they, they really began to uh, challenge the, this hegemony. And what they argue in this work is that Roosevelt went through four different sort of approaches, stages towards um, uh, Germany and towards Nazism. In the first term, they argue that he was largely a bystander to Nazi persecution of the Jews, that Roosevelt was primarily concerned with pushing his New Deal agenda, um, and that was primarily his focus, and he did not want to be distracted by it. In the second term, he begins to take something of an activist stance. He begins loosening immigration laws uh, and promoting plans to resettle European Jews, especially after Kristallnacht. Then they talk about a third stage with the onset of war in 1939. Um, we begin to see that that opening that had occurred during his second term begins to, 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 to um, close some in the name of increased security. And that only late in his third term do we see a renewed commitment uh, by Roosevelt to helping imperiled Jews. He created the War Refugee Board. He had more activism on the Palestine question. Um, and so what they show is that the record was mixed. Um, and 
it's in, it was in the wake of this work that there began to be many more sort of rethinkings and reconsiderations that have appeared in this time period. Um, several books have appeared, uh, including my, my own uh, book that came out several years ago. Uh, I think most uh, uh, influential of all of these works is Becky Erbelding, uh, her book, Rescue Board. And Becky Erbelding was the chief archivist for the exhibition that you're now hosting in your museum. We also see there's a re-questioning on the situation of Holocaust survivors in Canada that's been going on with Adari Goldberg's really important work. So there's so these books have come sort of in the wake of, of Richard Brightman's reconsideration of the role of FDR. And the concern is that we're uh, what you sort of unites all of these works is that we're trying to pen, spend more time focusing on the question of context. And it's led many of us to, 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 to hardly be forgiving of FDR, but looking at what was possible in various circumstances and at different historical moments and the way that his administration couldn't be so easily categorized as either purely hostile towards or sympathetic towards European Jewry. And there are some signs that this historical understanding, which stresses the ambiguity of the moment, which does not overtly praise or, or, or damn FDR, is beginning to take hold. The first of these, of course, is the exhibition Americans in the Holocaust, which appeared first at the museum in um, 2018, which is really this pivotal moment in some ways for the Holocaust Museum, because it's really perhaps the, 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 the first time I've seen a museum create one exhibition in its basement, this temporary one, that challenged the permanent exhibition that was happening upstairs. It was really quite fascinating because you have two different renderings of the history in within the same museum. And now, you know, of course, much more recently, the, the new Ken Burns documentary, which expands upon this importance of historical context in examining the, these different questions. Um, so, as a way to conclude, I just want to try to be uh, mindful of people's time. What, what, what I would like to advocate for and what I've, what I've been advocating for in some of these different talks is we're, we're, we're at this moment where the, the pendulum between these two different poles of, of attitudes towards um, the Roosevelt administration, right, this pendulum has kind of moved to a middle position where we recognize that on the one hand, the United States did more than any other of the Western allies to come to the aid of imperiled Jews, but also at the same time had the capacity to have done much, much more that we can pause for a moment. And perhaps we can think about some other questions that we have been overlooking in this attempt to, to try to discern whether America was good for the Jews or bad for the Jews. All right. So what we might do instead is start thinking about comparing the fate of different groups of Jewish refugees from various countries to us to better assess why some Jews were successful at getting into the United States like Kurt Baum, but others were not like Ella Kalka. Perhaps more importantly, we might spend time examining the lives of those refugees who did successfully make it into the United States. As, the, as many memoirs of this period demonstrate, the, the uh, embrace of America was really quite uh, ambivalent, or I would say the embrace of survivors in America was really quite ambivalent. It was a period that was filled with trauma for refugees who felt both deep shame at their own destitution and for being saved, while so many other were left behind. Deep resentment for having been treated like immigrants uh, who were expected, like Kurt Baum, to make their own way in America while contending with now what we would all call PTSD. We might also begin to investigate more of the place of anti-Semitism within the larger context of American racism and other forms of bigotry. We might look at how issues of gender and class and political affiliations impacted the success or failure of different refugee applications. And finally, as our understanding of who constitutes Holocaust victims is expanding to include other groups who are similarly targeted for total extermination, we might also consider the fate of people perceived to be disabled, of Roma, of Afro-Germans and others who are almost always denied entry into the United States and their historical experience at the hands of Nazi oppressors and American refusal still awaits to be told. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Trachtenberg. 
Um, so I'm going to go to our Q&A box. So again, if you have any questions about um, what was just discussed, any anything else related to the exhibit that you um, want to share for a discussion question, please feel free to type that in the Q&A box. There's a button on the bottom of your screen. Um, so actually, first, I want to share a very kind note from um, Joel Berkowitz, who says, thank you um, for the kind words, Barry. So glad that you're virtually here and that the Milwaukee community and beyond has this opportunity to learn from you. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Joel. And our first question is from Stephen, who asks, how many total Jewish refugees were admitted to the U.S. during the World War II period? So we, we don't have exact totals, um, but the best research on this has been done by Beckier Belding, who wrote this book, uh, uh, Rescue Board. And it's probably in the exhibition, but uh, what she did was she looked at the period. So it's not exactly during the World War II period um, that she looks at, because once the US gets into the war, almost all the, you know, the uh, uh, almost all refugee traffic stops uh, almost entirely at that point. But she looks at the period from, I think, 1938 until 1941. And she went through, I think it was the New York Times, which listed every ship that came into the United States and, and did this, the totaling up. And what she discovered, if memory serves, was that um, about 110,000 um, German Jews found or, or refugees found sanctuary, Jewish refugees found sanctuary in that time period. So it really overshadows uh, uh, any other country at the time period. And so again, it sort of points to the kind of the mixed record in a way, right? So the United States did more than any other country, but had enormous capacity to do much, much more, right? So part of the research that I did for my master's thesis now 30 years ago, where I discovered the El Kolka case was when I was working in the archives of the Quakers, the American Friends Service Committee, um, while they were working on this plan that was called the, the Roger, the Ro Roger Wagner's uh, Act, um, which would have allowed for 20,000 German children to come in over the quota in the fiscal years 1939, 1940, there were hundreds and hundreds of letters from Quakers all over the United States who offered to provide housing. They're like, you know, I have a farm in Iowa and I can easily take four children. I, you know, I, I've got a place in Indiana, then we can take two children. So there was just this capacity, right? It's also the largest Jewish community in the world, which has enormous capacity. Um, but the immigration laws, you know, they were strict and they had their quotas. So that by 1939, the quota for people trying to get into Germany was nine years long, right? It's a quota of about 30,000 people um, every year. And the list was over 300,000 long. And our next question is from Mark. Um, Mark says, thank you for an excellent presentation. Did American media purposely hide the facts? I understand the New York Times did not print much. Historians disagree on this. I tend to side with those scholars who, and, and, and I think, you know, Deborah Lipstadt, this is what she said in, in her first book, was that for those looking for the information, they could find it easily in the American press, right? So when you read the accounts of American Jews who are reading the American press, whether they're reading it in the mainstream press, like you know, the New York Times or the Herald Tribune, or they're reading it in the Jewish press or they're reading it in the Yiddish press, they're finding out a lot and they're piecing it all together. But the truth is that there was very little widespread conception of a targeted campaign against European Jewry until long after the war, right? We know that the term Holocaust itself doesn't even come into use widely until the late 1960s, first among Jews, and then more broadly into the 1970s. So there's not yet a conception of it. Um, and there's a massive two front war going on. And so the information's there, but it's not clear to me that they're burying it the way uh, uh, Leth argues, 
but they're not always prioritizing it in a way that afterwards we would certainly have wanted them to. Questions coming in. Uh, Mary asks, uh, do you have any comments on the voyage of the St. Louis? Sure. Um, the story of the St. Louis is very often held up as sort of the, the archetype of American indifference um, towards the, the plight of European Jews. The story, and again, the, the exhibition, I think, does a brilliant job of, um, of showing this. So if you haven't gone and seen it, I'm assuming it's in the, the traveling part of the exhibition. You can sort of confirm this, maybe Kelly. But the 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 story of the St. Louis has generally been told of one where a ship was trying to come to the United States, just filled with refugees, and they were turned away and they were sent uh, to, back to their deaths in Europe. And the reality is much more complicated as the exhibition takes, uh, you know, takes note of uh, the, the very short version, because we could go on a while about this, is that in uh, the, the summer, I think it's uh, late May of 1939, uh, a group of refugees are on the ships. This is before the war starts, right? And several years before the Holocaust starts, um, a group of, of Jews are on a ship that's bound for Cuba. Most of the people aboard that ship had visas to enter into the United States, but because of this wait list, they had to abide their time outside of the United States until the month and year came up that was on their visa, and then they could enter into the country. So uh, refugees are going at this point by 1939, 1940, wherever they can, you know, in the world, they're, they're going not only to Cuba, but they're going to Bolivia, they're going to Montevideo, they're going, you know, Lisbon, Casablanca, right? Um, all of these places to, to wait out uh, the time until they can get in. The fact that they have the visa is the thing that lets them leave Germany, um, but they can't yet get into the United States. So they're on their way to Cuba. And as the ship is departing, Cuban policy shifts because of anti-Semitism in Cuba that's rising with the number of Jews who are uh, biding their time there. And so Cuba tells the, 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 the shipping company, like, we're not going to let you land here. The ship goes anyways, and they're not allowed um, to, 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 to land there. And so the ship is stuck in the port of, of, of Havana. All sorts of agencies try to negotiate a solution to this. Um, they can't just be entered into the United States because there's a quota system and it would have bumped other people who were waiting and it would have put them further down the list. The State Department is actually very, very involved. American Jewish agencies are very involved. They try to bribe the, the Cuban government that doesn't work. Eventually, the ship does turn around, goes back to Europe. And the passengers are deposited in other European countries. Uh, some go to England, some go to Netherlands, some go to France. Um, and it's considered at the time to be a great success. Um, what we know is that ultimately Hitler invades the, you know, these places in Europe and in the Netherlands and France. And some 250 of the people who had been aboard the ship, about a third, were ultimately killed during the war, many of them during the Holocaust itself. So the What's interesting about the St. Louis is that it's an exception to the general rule where some 1,100 ships did successfully come into the United States, but they came in according to the processes. Um, these exceptions were not permitted. So it's less of a story, I think, of straight up American anti-Semitism, although that's obviously a piece to it, but it's, it's certainly a, a sign of the barbarity of this racist immigration system that had been enacted by Congress, you know, 15 years before, which everyone supported in America. You know, the, the polling data, which the exhibition shows very well, is that the numbers, even after Kristallnacht, even after um, all of these crises that take place, that people don't want to change the immigration law. They still don't want to let more migrants in. It's still a time period when people are very, very isolationist, nativist, you know, which are just another way of saying racist. Thank you. Let's see, our next question is from Denise. Um, Denise asks, do you feel like the government, the U.S. government at the time, used the quota system to ensure any immigrant was to their benefit, i.e. fit yes. to work, age appropriate, desirable characteristics? Um, and then she says, it sounds really similar to Germany in a way. Yeah, so... 
I don't have the book handy, but I was just teaching it um, last week to my students. There's a book called Hitler's American Model by James Q. Whitman, uh, which you may be familiar with, um, in which he lays out this, this argument that you're sort of making kind of explicitly that when the Nazis came to power, they were trying to figure out what was going to be the legal basis for the new uh, anti-Jewish regulations that they wanted to put into place. And so they went around looking for available models and the one place they could turn to was the United States. Um, the United States was obviously a place where there's deep segregation, there's a, there's a color line, black codes, right? It's the time of Jim Crow. And they realized that that was actually not the model that they wanted to put in place. They didn't wanna reduce Jews to a permanent underclass, they wanted them out, right? So they needed different rules, but the rules that interested them the most were uh, immigration laws. And um, they paid a lot of attention to the way in which the United States had structured its immigration laws to um, what, what was talked about at the time in the halls of Congress in the 1920s was to allow the 25 million or so Eastern and Southern Europeans who had come into the United States in the previous four decades, a chance to quote unquote, whiten up, uh, to give them a chance to sort of integrate into the, the dominant society. When the United States um, under Hoover enacts this LPC proviso, the likely to become a public charge, that's where, Denise, uh, they begin looking at each individual immigrant to see basically like, are they going to be good for America or not, right? So they're acting not out of what we might have hoped would be humanitarian concerns, right? Or concerns uh, that respected the fundamental right to life of all human beings, but they're thinking in very narrow terms about, is this good for America or not? And 90% of the time they decided that those immigrants were not. Yeah, I definitely have to um, concur. That was one of the most striking things about um, the exhibit is those public polling numbers um, yeah. I mean, it really lays out um, that disparity. Um, our next question is from Win uh, Winston. Um, Winston says, thanks for your very interesting talk. Uh, how important was the diary of Anne Frank to knowledge of the Holocaust in the United States? And how has it perhaps given a very selective view, i.e. Western European of the Holocaust? Yeah, thank you for that question, um, Winston. The diary of Anne Frank was you know, fundamental uh, for Americans coming to understand about the Holocaust in the 1950s, although it did give a very, what we might think of as a very skewed view. I actually teach it to my university level classes um, in a class on Holocaust diaries and memoirs, um, because the, you know, the diary that we read that was published the one with Eleanor Roosevelt's introduction is not the diary that Anne wrote. Um, uh, this may be new to some of you, but, you know, Anne, she, she wrote her diary, um, but then uh, I think it's about 16, 18 months into her confinement, a radio broadcast came asking people in hiding in the Netherlands to preserve their, their, their diaries for after the war. So what Anne decides to do is to rewrite her diary. She'd already been writing short stories. She, she was a writer. She wanted to become a writer, a journalist, and a writer of fiction. So she begins to rewrite her diary, um, updating the entries, creating pseudonyms for the different figures, changing the scenes, now imagining an audience outside of herself for it. So after the war, uh, when her father returns, to Amsterdam, he's given what survived of those different documents and he stitched together the original diaries, the rewritten diaries and some of the short stories and then published it as this work. Um, so this work of course is widely uh, popular. In many ways, it's a story of the Holocaust that's not really about the Holocaust because it ends before uh, the Franks actually experienced you know, the real violence of the Holocaust before they're deported to the Westerbork transit camp and then to Auschwitz and then you know, to Bergen-Belsen where Anne and her sister Margot pass away. So it allowed Americans to sort of talk about the Holocaust without having to engage in the, the true horrors of it. And it took really many um, decades before some ways that Frank's diary was decentered in some ways from popular imagination and um, like images of Auschwitz came to dominate, you know, which was a site of 
1.3 million people who were murdered, the vast majority of them European Jews. Um, so it took kind of a long time for that view to sort of be corrected. Um, but it's actually still an amazing diary that's, that's worth our time and attention, I think. Thank you. If anyone else has any questions, uh, please drop them in the Q&A. I do have a question actually that um, yeah. I thought of as, as you were talking. Um, I'm curious, so do we know like what impact, if any, did um, the Holocaust have on U.S. immigration policies? Like was was that a turning point in-, in It was listening? not. Um, no, I mean, what's what's horrific is that it's not until the mid 1960s that there is a reworking, uh, a fundamental reworking of American immigration law. We have two exceptions that emerge in 1948 and 1952, where there's exceptions are, that are made largely out of Cold War interests, then about uh, sort of concern for the fate of the one and a half million or more survivors who were stuck in displaced persons camps after the war. Um, that And these allow about 200,000 or so um, survivors to, to enter into the United States. But it's not until the, the, the 1960s where we begin to see the introduction of the lottery system that emerges um, with all the exceptions, getting back, I think, to Denise's question about you know, letting in people who are going to be, quote unquote, beneficial to America, as opposed to just sort of embracing the people of the world. I'm going to give a moment for if anyone else has a yeah, of course. questions. Yeah, happy to answer any questions I can. So in the meantime, um, if if you haven't stopped by to see the exhibit at Milwaukee Central Library, please do. Um, it'll be on display through January 5th, 2024. Um, and following this program, um, we will send out the recording um, usually in a few days. And we'll also send out a downloadable PDF of um, the upcoming programs, as well as our library resource list, which includes books for all ages. So um, there's kids books on there and uh, books for teens and adults. Um, Oh, here we go. We've got a question from uh, from Joel. Joel says, thank you for the moving masterfully presented lecture. Could you expand a bit on the final point you made about how the treatment of other refugee groups sheds additional light on and or complicate the issues you've explored here? Sure. Um, I mean, what we see is that the I'm trying to figure out how how to to answer this well. Is that you know we 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 have this I think fundamental conflict um, between this notion that comes to us from the Enlightenment, right? That this fundamental equality of all human beings, and we believe and we imagine that at its best, our our government and our various institutions, our religious groups, but and, and all sort of strive towards trying to realize that fundamental equality. The problem is that laws are made by nations. And although nations um, often have the language of, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, right? Liberty, equality, fraternity. Ultimately, it's the interests of the nation that, that come to dominate. And what we've seen is that in American history, all too often, um, what's considered good for America is really a, uh, what is good for to reinforcing the structures of power that that already exist. And so, what we see, you know, in the the nineteen twenties and nineteen thirties, is that the immigration laws become so tight and so restrained. But the population of the United States is actually declining because more people are leaving than trying to get in because um, uh, the, the restrictions are so great and uh, opportunities are perhaps better abroad. At the same time, though, the United States is, you know, forcibly deporting well over a million people of Mexican ancestry 
uh, many of them citizens in roundups in the southwestern part of the United States, where in, even in cities like Los Angeles, cordoning off entire neighborhoods, loading people up and dropping them across the border. Um, talk about comparisons, right, to, to Nazism at times, you know, in the 1930s at least. Um, and so it's always been the case that the the doors to enter the United States have been um, guarded and protected. And so it's, I, I think the, 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 the question for us sort of as a scholar is always be thinking about what causes those doors to open a little bit and then what causes them to close, right? They're never fully closed, but they've also never been fully open. You know, the, I remember as an undergraduate in an American history class learning that some of the first anti-immigrant sentiments happened in the United States as far back as the 1790s, when people were saying the country's full, right? And that's the 1790s. So this is a long, long standing question. Um, we, you know, we certainly saw it with the, 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 the Trump administration with the, the Muslim bans that were going on. We see it today in the Biden administration with the, you know, he's expanding the wall along the American South. Like this kind of fear mongering is going on and on without any recognition of the underlying social problems that are pushing people to migrate for their own safety. Thanks for that. Great. Uh, let's see, Jeannie says, um, again, thank you for the lecture and the exhibit. Um, I'm looking forward to visiting. Um, and also a comment, when the USA needs to fill the ranks for war, the immigration door seems to open, but when these same people ask for benefits earned, they are shown the door. It's been a longstanding problem. Yeah, I don't think the United States is unique in that regard, but um, it's, it certainly hasn't stood up for good behavior in that regard. Well, Dr. Trachtenberg, I just want to thank you so much uh, from That's everyone here honor. at MPL. Thank you. And I also want to thank um, our partners at the Nathan and Esther Pell's Holocaust Education Resource Center. Thank you, Michael, for um, tuning in uh, this evening as well. And also thank you to uh, ALA and the uh, USHMM um, for um, creating this uh, traveling exhibit that we can host at our library here. So um, please log on to mpl.org uh, to find out more about upcoming programs. And like I said, we'll share out the program list um, and the recording and that uh, resource list uh, probably within a few days. Um, so thanks to everyone so much for logging in tonight. I hope um, you enjoyed this presentation. And um, I know I've learned a lot. Um, this exhibit teaches so much um and definitely worth visiting and please consider um attending the upcoming program so thank you so much have a great evening thank you dr trachtenberg thank you and have a great evening everyone bye now